Next, we have episode five uh, of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. If you haven't caught on yet, we're going through episode by episode. And this episode five was called Plumbing Overflows and Return Pumps. And we have a core belief, some what we believe that matters, and some hard lessons learned that we want to share with you about plumbing overflows and return pumps, starting with the core belief. Core belief in relation to plumbing overflows and return pumps is the return pump and plumbing are the heart mm. and circulatory uh, uh, system of the tank. Mm. The best option will be leak-proof, kink-proof, failure-resistant method of connecting the life support to the tank. So this is the circulatory system. It should be leak-proof, kink-proof, a failure-resistant method of connecting the life support mm. to the tank. That's what best looks like. So, and everything we're talking about with what we believe matters and hard lessons learned revolve around that core belief, starting with the overflow. Overflow gurgle and return pump hum detracts from the tank. Uh, use a bean animal and use a DC solution. Yeah, so that electric hum that comes from, you know, your like old mag drives. Oh world. man, I had a mag 12 on my 125. The constantly. Uh, and I've, I've I've actually it's you know sometimes they can echo so loud that down in the basement they're reverberating through the stand through the floor and even amplified in different rooms. It takes away from the beauty of the tank. This is no, not no powerful. Question. This is not beautiful. Okay, and the gurgle of a uh, what do they call those dursos. Ah, uh, I have little bubbles so going in there. So hard to uh, to tune in, and you know a little salt creep gets stuck in your little air valve or whatever, and it's back to the start all over again. Uh, the water, the sound of falling, rushing water, uh, not only makes you want to go to the bathroom when you're sitting there all day long, but it's just, it, it, it does, it detracts from the entire thing. Like now I know that there's an aquarium there, but if I didn't hear that sound, you know, sometimes I look over and like, oh yeah, look at that. I don't mind the sound of moving water. A little bit. I don't like gurgling. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, those the are different toilets, things. Toilet bowls suck. Yeah, yeah I yep. don't know. Okay, so in that spirit, uh, the bean animal, which is three, three, a primary one, which is just uh, uh, a full siphon. Yep. If that one isn't tuned perfect, the next one will take just a little bit of the water. Yep. And then there is an the emergency secondary. one. Uh, in that case, that thing is, uh, from an overflow perspective, uh, is like, going to be probably leak proof because it's got emergencies. It'll be quiet. Uh, it probably won't kink a failure resistant method. Yeah. That's the bean animal. Bean animal is the way to go. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, just the sole fact that I have a primary, a secondary, which is the backup when we were talking redundancy in the last one. And, uh, also that emergency, that's the backup to the backup. Mm -hmm. uh, not only is from a safety standpoint, but yes, for tunability and uh, you know a little ball valve. Better yet, a DC pump that you can choose different flow rates. All right, another thing that we believe matters in terms of uh, plumbing overflow and return pumps: overflow overflows in the tank, like an overflow tower yeah. inside the tank, is bad for flow and aquascapes, uh, but it does allow you to put it flush to the wall. We talked about that earlier. Yep. Uh, but I, I will avoid these at all costs inside the tank because I really want to create flow behind the aquascape, mm. not just in front of it. Uh, and it's really, really hard to do once you put those overflow towers inside. I mean, this was a lesson that we, this is a lesson in flow that we learned from WWC. Uh, and we tried to apply on the 750 XXL and found it's really hard to apply that with a overflow tower inside the actual tank. Uh, like you need more pumps or power heads to eliminate dead spots because that thing is in the middle of the dang tank. Mm -hmm. True. All right, uh, another one here, what we believe is matter, is PVC when you can, yep. because that's the nature of leak proof, kink proof, failure resistant uh, method of connecting the circulatory mm -hmm. system. Hybrid when you can't, meaning let's have hard connections yeah. uh, and on it. Like I'm gonna elbows. Put, put elbows, I'm gonna hard secure it to the yeah. uh, uh, sump area with a hard connection. I may even use like a T, uh, a barbed T so mm -hmm. that like I'm not bending the tubing too much. I'm just giving it a nice angle that will send it out the yeah. direction or Y. 
So hybrid when you can't, and you got to use soft tubing, and so be it. Uh, it. I mean, don't just put the end of your soft tubing on the end of your return pump, and then snake that thing all the way up to the back of your return line or back of your return. Uh, that's not kink proof. That's not failure resistant. That's not leak proof. Yeah, and if you use soft. Uh, tubing probably use a size bigger than you think that you actually need yeah, because sure. it will kink at some point in time mm -hmm. for some reason or another uh, and go with the natural arc so the stuff is kind of rounded from the tube yeah. that it's been on yeah, don't fight the arc to make that that yeah. corner if that... you need to get a PVC like barbed uh, elbow or mm -hmm. 45 or T or whatever rather than trying to like make it go yeah. 90 degrees because you're yeah. just gonna kick it yeah it's not good uh, we also believe that matters, uh, this is a really good one, DC pumps tune better than your gate valve. Uh, and I mean, especially, you know, there's, especially there's pumps out there that have so many multiple layers of uh, changing of flow rates. You know, when the Neptune core speaks out to me because there's like 16 different steps up and down, meaning that I can change just the minute little bit of flow. Unlike some pumps that have, DC pumps that may have like five steps. Well, one of those will get me close, and then I'll have to use the ball valve. Uh, but, you know, if you choose the right DC pump, you can almost eliminate the need for that ball valve just because you have, you can uh, pick the flow rate. Yeah, so I think of uh, the Varios, actually. It was, you know, yeah. used to be yeah. one of my favorites. Uh, you know, it's five a little speeds. bit older design at this point, yeah. right? It's only got five speeds, mm -hmm. and that means for the most part, I'm probably going to still be stuck trying to monkey with that valve. Yeah. Uh, and it, like you don't really know how much you've done. You got to wait ten minutes to figure it out. Instead, if I just go up and like you know have it go one of sixteen steps faster, I think the wow. Vectra has a lot of different stops yeah. as mm -hmm. well. So well, you know from and, Ecotech, yeah, you could actually use some of those pumps in their uh, in their apps and get more steps than what you actually get from push button. You know, that's actually kind of goes down to a reliable return pump too. Is like I always really like the fact that the Varios had the little float switch in it, so if it ever got too dry, it would just turn off so it doesn't spin and burn out. Mm -hmm. But the new generation of pumps like the Vectra and the Core and the CJ uh, SDC, they just turn off. They, they recognize that uh, the water levels is spinning faster than normal. In fact, like the uh, Core, if you have an Apex, it will actually tell you what's going on. It has mm -hmm. like five or six different uh, uh, alarms of not just that the pump is failing, but why it's failing. Mm -hmm. What's happening to it is there's a voltage issue, it's a water level issue. Uh, I forget what all the actual uh, alarms mm -hmm. are, but when the alarm goes off, it will actually tell you the specific thing that is wrong with it, and so you can go fix it. So uh, DC yeah. tunes better. DC definitely tunes better. I can tell you I'll never go back now. I, I don't want to monkey. I don't want to crawl underneath there and spin that valve. I forget. We which forget. Yeah, forget which way is open. You forget which way is closed. And then you can only make the slightest little thing. And then you have to sit there and listen and listen and wait and wait. And then go, no, it wasn't it. And turn. Or walk yeah. up. One button. Boom. Done. Move Man. on. Move on with life. So much nicer. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, <laughs> a theme here. Theme here. Man, you're hearing this over and over and over again. Leak proof, kink proof, failure resistant method for the circulatory system, dual returns. Again, I mean, it's the third time we've said it here yeah. in three different sections now. And this is one of those easy things, like even if you haven't done this in the past and it's like you already have your system up and running, most of the time yeah. you have two returns uh, or two return holes on there and you can just kind of cut one off and cap it or whatever and put another return pump. And like, even if you just, like just need a, to do it quick and dirty. Like one of those can actually be soft tubing. You know, it doesn't have to be hard because you have the other one hard, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even then, and this is actually a good point is if you do use soft tubing, then having two is probably even better because of the kink issue, Yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, plumbing overflows and return pumps. Uh, what we believe matters is a, this, this is gonna ruffle some feathers, I believe, but we do believe it matters. One times turnover rate. Uh, one times at a minimum. Uh, I don't know how many times that I got told that 10 times turnover. And actually as a customer service agent before we you know, started going down this path like years ago, uh, I'd tell people like, oh, so size and return pumps for me. And I'm like, you know, 
uh, you, here's your how many gallons you have in the system. You know, we typically aim for around you know ten times turnover. Here's the size pump that you should get. Well, a lot of times it turns out to be a big expensive pump loud. to get ten times turnover. Super loud and everything too. Uh, when actually at a minimum one times turnover. Here's here's the one of the easy ways to measure it is if you, the speed of your pump and the turnover from the display down into the sump and back to the display is enough to heat your dis keep your display water like 78 degrees, that's enough. Probably enough. That's probably enough. I mean, the only thing we're really trying to do is filter the water down there yep. uh, and uh, heat it. And so, yes, the more times you turn it over, the better the filter socks, the fleece, probably the skimmer will work. There is a point of diminishing return because you got to remember, even at one times, it's got 24 passes a day at yep. this. Once know? an hour, the entire okay. body of water. Yeah, so at three times, it's got 75 passes every single day, you know, over the month, man, so many times. So, like, it doesn't have to be. And yes, it does get better the more you go up, but not only will the pumps be more expensive, especially if you're running duals, mm -hmm. uh, but the pumps themselves tend to be louder. And all that water gurgling through the system is definitely to a tune. lot wa uh, louder as it's rushing through, man. Yeah. I got 2,000 gallons an hour flowing through this thing. Well, a, lo a lot of times, you know, the, you, here's, I'll put it this way. 10 times turnover for some sys for some systems is too much for your one inch bulkheads to handle. One inch bulkhead can, is only rated for like 600, I think 660 gallons per hour, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, uh, how many how many people have one inch uh, bulkheads on your tank? Because it's it's very common. common, very common. So you're talking like 10 times turnover might be more than 600 gallons per hour uh, or 660 gallons per hour. Uh, which maxing case it out? you're maxing that thing out. No wonder it has sound uh, issues. All right, another one here that I uh, believe matters for uh, plumbing overflow return pumps is when they're clean, they uh, take the most power when they're dirty. We already mentioned this a, a little bit, but uh, there's a couple of ways to know this. So when you don't have to wait to like just look at it, decide when it's time to maintenance your return pump. Yeah. You can actually just monitor the amount of power that it's consuming. Yeah. Uh, and if it used to take 60 watts and it's now taking 45, that means it's probably getting gummed up and requires maintenance. And one of those ways is if you have a fancy controller like an Apex, you can have the power monitoring. Not only could you just go check it, but an alarm will actually go off and mm -hmm. tell you, hey, it's time to clean this pump. It's mm -hmm. taking less power. Mm -hmm. But you can also get something like a kilowatt. Yeah, the uh, kilowatt strip or even just the single kilowatt plug, it has like amperage and wattage draw monitor, or not monitoring, but at least it has it displays it for you. Mm -hmm. And I can walk by and I can look at the screen and go, oh man, it's pulling you know, 15, 15 less watts. So, and like sometimes, dude, it won't, it's supposed to be pulling 30 watts and it's actually pulling six. Like the, like, the tunes what? pump that you have, man, is barely doing anything. Yeah, you know? exactly. Okay, so. Uh, the the little kilowatt, all it is is a little thing. It plugs in the wall. You plug the cord in. It has a little display and tells you how much wattage is taken. I think it costs thirty bucks. Easy, uh, easy money. Not only can you put it on the the thing you care about most, just in general, being your return pump, but you can plug anything into it temporarily. Like it's maintenance day uh, once a quarter. Yeah, take your little kilowatt uh, around, plug your uh, each of your pumps into it, and find out what the wattage draw is, and be like. No, oh, last last week they were at 50 watts, and this week they're at 25. That's 50% power loss. Probably yeah. time to clean them. And like those little tips, man, are like instead of just wasting my time cleaning it all the time, like these are indications that it needs to be cleaned, not just a random waste of time. Yeah. Uh, or worse, <laughs> avoiding it when it actually did need to be cleaned. All right. So hard lessons in terms of plumbing overflows and return pumps that we would like to avoid. Mm, we're talking higher paths to success and we're sharing the, our hard lessons so you can be on that higher path. One of the things is assuming that barbed fittings or barbs can be removed easily. And I, I fell into this trap before. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to plumb this thing together. And when I when it comes time to disassemble it or maintenance it, I just got to pull that tube right off of the barbed fitting and I'm good to go. Good luck trying to get that thing off. Yeah. So barbed does not make it like necessarily replaceable no. or mo you know modular. Or I've, I've so many times had to take the razor blade to cut that uh, piece of tubing off of the barb to get it off. And, and then, you have to be really careful not to nick the barbs because now you'll create leak points mm -hmm, too. Exactly. Uh, with the razor blade. Yeah. yeah. 
Barbs uh, are not easily removed. Yeah, and uh, don't for a moment also not use the ratchet clamps on the barb fittings because today it might not leak, but as the the tubing gets harder and more rigid uh, over time, it will tend to you know create a leak that wasn't there today. Mm. And sometimes you won't notice it because it's probably gonna be a drip until one day you go back there and it looks like stalactites and stalagmites of silk creep have bit each other. From yeah. the, like, like the crystal cave back there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, think about that in, in its entirety. Uh, another hard lesson is, um, we actually see this in our water change lines also, clear lines grow gunk. They're just ambient light everywhere. Unless they ran through some completely dark area, uh, you see it on soft tubing that has a refugium. Uh, and you're not on you. I mean, you see it in a refugium where the, not only your refugium chamber, but the side of your skimmer body is growing gunk. And then this chamber over here is growing gunk because it has a, a line to the refugium. You just picture that inside your uh, plumbing lines and your tubing lines, like clear plastic um, when it comes to like braided nylon type tubing, it's gonna grow gunk. Yeah, I, you know what? I always call it braided nylon. I forget what it's actually really called. Uh, uh, it's not nylon. Oh, oh uh, yeah, 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 polyethylene or something. I forget, but it's braided somewhere other. But yeah. I call it that all the time. We too. all uh, we it's all my it. DNA. <laughs> uh, the problem though is that braided nylon <laughs> I'm calling it now yeah. uh, is the best for not kinking. Mm -hmm. Black, but it, you you can see through it, yeah. and it will grow stuff in it eventually. Yeah. So yeah. try to keep it dark. Black silicone, though. No. The black, uh, the, there's that black tubing that we sell mm -hmm. that won't grow anything, but it's thinner and it kinks. It easier. kinks easy, yeah. yeah. So there's a double-edged sword there. That, that again, the thicker the tube, the more you oversize it, the harder it is to kink. Mm. So I, if I were to do this again, I would probably use the black stuff. And I would probably use barbed elbows and stuff to make sure I'm using as straight a runs as I can mm -hmm. and prevent the kinks uh, over time. Yep. But clear will grow algae, it will grow cyano, it will grow all kinds of stuff. Even if you don't have the refugium, like I said in, the, in that example, just the ambient light of your room will grow gunk. Yeah, and like I, if it grew some turf algae and then it just broke off and clogged your valve, done. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Uh, that leads to uh, soft, speaking of soft tubing, one of the hard lessons we like to avoid in the future, soft tubing kinks and changes shape over time. It's anything that's got a little bit of pressure like this. Well, it's really solid today, but it just, over time, the, the, over time the pressure just pushes on it. So, uh, you know, there's some things you can do, like you can use a ratchet clamps at different points to kind of like smush it straight. It yep. doesn't allow it to kink. Uh, you can do various things to do, but just because it's not kinking today, the soft tubing doesn't mean that it won't. And like, we've all plumbed a lot of soft tubing tanks, so I don't want to like paint it as a picture that you can't be done. But all this stuff should definitely be thought about yes. because it will create a higher percentage path to success for sure. We said that. Uh, was, that's kind of the running theme throughout this whole thing. Uh, most successful reefers have that uh, plan for the inevitable failure in the future. I'm gonna share this one here. Hard lessons to avoid in the future. Avoid elaborate <laughs> manifolds. Right? We have one on this tank right here. It never gets used. This 160, we've never used it. Okay, uh, so, well, we used it once for recirculating skimmer feed and yeah, now we true. don't. You know, sometimes people use them, it, but here's the thing is like, it's actually really hard to get the right flow rate out of a manifold. Mm -hmm. And like, if you design it wrong, you won't get it at first, but like, you know, if I had, you know, a pipe going here and there was an out on this end and four going down, yeah. the way it works is uh, water pressure resistance. actually just shoots out that way and very little of it will come yeah. down out the little yeah, port. Path or... So you, you have to be able to create equal distant pressure mm -hmm. and back pressure to get it to work the way that you want. And, you know, before you know it, like it's so elaborate. Well, what's the like if I want to run like I still got one return pump and I want to like run my carbon reactor off of it because I don't want to buy another pump. I'm going to buy more plumbing fittings and valves <laughs> than the cost of a little CJ thirty dollar pump. Hundred percent. Yeah, yep. and the little thirty dollar pump is so much easier to maintain. <laughs> I, I guess it's one less cord, yeah. and it looks way cooler. No question. Yeah. 
function. Remember what we said back in the uh, sump, uh, the the sump section when we were talking about it. Uh, function over form. Mm -hmm. So I would think do a manifold if you have a very distinct purpose for it, mm. and you've thought it out and said this is the best solution for me. But don't build a manifold and spend all that money on valves and pumps and you know, pipes and all the other yeah. stuff just because it looks cool per se, because you will probably never use it for its intended use. Ah, true, we, we don't. <laughs> I, there, are, there are definitely a lot of uses for it. What I'm getting at is know your use and build to that. Yep. All right. Yep. Uh, another hard lesson here is, uh, okay, this is, uh, we kind of talked about it mm -hmm. already, but hard lesson to avoid in the future is waiting for the return pump to literally stop working before maintenance. That's a low percentage path. Low path. Uh, I'm going to hit this one too. Right All right. After. Yeah. Hard lessons we'd like to avoid in the future. Lazy PVC gluing has related results. <laughs> and this isn't the, I mean, there's multiple ways to be lazy about your PVC gluing. Uh, for some people, they swear by, I, I don't use the primer before I uh, put, I just go glue. Uh, and uh, it's such a low pressure system, it doesn't matter. Uh, and probably one of the biggest culprits that I didn't even, you know, consider or know until, uh, you know, talking to you about it and plumbing and, you know, actually listening to 52 Weeks of Reefing is that uh, the burrs left over when you're cutting pipe, especially if you use like a saw or something like that, or even a hacksaw or whatever to cut the pipe, it leaves such a, a rough cut and those little burrs, if you don't, what do you, what do you call that, the tool that? Deburr. Yeah, or deburr, sandpaper. Or sandpaper or anything yeah. like that. They actually have tools for it. Um, but those little burrs, you know, as you put the pipe together, grind into the other piece, leaving a leak point. I, I'm one of my big frag tech systems, the first ones. I had to replumb it three times because it developed a leak at various points right yeah. away. And it just was just gluing, doing it sloppy. Just, uh, and then I stopped doing it that way. And now I follow all the rules. I, you know, do the primer. We can debate the primer, how much is needed. I don't know. I have never had a problem since I started using it right. I use the primer. I cut the pipe straight. Uh, I deburr, deburr it, it with mm -hmm. a piece of sandpaper. It doesn't produce all those little grooves in it. I smush it all the, or put a healthy amount of glue on both the pipe as well as the valve, make sure that, or fitting, make sure that the glue doesn't get too far into the valve or, or hit anything. Push it all the way in, give it a quarter turn and hold. So, Cause it wants to like swell out and spit it out. Mm -hmm. Just turn it and hold. If I do that on every one of those joints, I've never developed a leak yeah. and I've done those are your it. results. I don't even know how many thousands of times now. The uh, lazy, way lazy way doesn't mean that it won't work because it does. Just lower, lower percentage path. And here's the piece of it is, do you value your time or your money more? Because if you value your time, just whip it all together. Yep. If you value your money more and you don't want $500 worth of plumbing going in the trash and having to start over again, well, take the extra <laughs> take the little extra bit time. of time. It doesn't take that much just to, just to take the burrs off. You know, it's not <laughs> that using the primer isn't that much harder. And I, I, the primer one I'm a little on the fence about because I've I read studies both ways. Yeah. But the part about it is that on the studies, in terms of leaks, they're always putting it under like 80 PSI. Tons of pressure. You know? And we don't do that There's here. There's not that much pressure. So I, it's kind of a moot point. I, I just part of my method that I do and it always has. But end of the story, Lazy PVC gluing has related results. Hard lesson. <laughs> another, expensive lesson. Oh, expensive lesson. Another hard lesson here, uh, and I mean, uh, we've we've said it. I've heard it all over the place too. But hard lesson: learn from, spend the extra money. Unions everywhere. Uh, if you think that you're no, I'm not going to take that apart. Uh, I don't need to union that. No, think again. Make it so you can take it apart. Overplan unions, and then uh, you know you'll have a easy to maintain, easy to take apart stuff. Here's the part that most people don't get about unions until you actually use them: is when I'm gluing a, a PVC uh, plumbing together on the sump to the tank. Uh, there's all these little you know angles that you need to get perfect, and the way that people normally do them oh, is yeah. put a little yeah. mark on the pipe, yeah, and yeah, put yeah. a little mark on the fitting, and then when you do the squish it turn, in, you have you know line up. 10 seconds to line it up perfect. And if you don't line it up perfect and you get those two things exactly You're right, off. well now 
the thing is shooting, instead of going straight up, it's kind of shooting out. Kind of putting, shooting in. Putting pressure on the other joints of the whole plumbing job. If it's not straight, then it's putting uh, pressure on the bulkhead yep. or the attachment yep. uh, onto the sump as well. Mm -hmm. However, instead of having just that 90 on it, if I put a uh, union here, I can loosen it up. And now this thing just swivels any way or direction I, I want. I don't have to care at all I about can, how I get it, I, you know, the angle. So the more unions you have and the more true union ball valves you have, yes. the easier it is you know, for a newer person to set this up without having to redo it and get one of those things wrong and then 100%. put you know, pressure and compression uh, that creates leaks or even snaps, you know, like there's a, a less expensive uh, black bulkheads. Mm -hmm. are really kind of like what I call hobby grade. Yeah. Uh, they're not really designed to ha hold a lot of pressure. Hold the ABS. Yeah, yeah the ABS yeah. ones. They look slick and that's why we all use them. They're low profile, but they mm. should not have a lot of pressure on them. I think, you know, the good thing about unions too is, uh, you know, we talked about in this, uh, earlier on in sumps, we talked about moving a sump or changing a sump or changing plumbing and stuff like that. Uh, uh, easier to tackle, I think, with unions. Mm -hmm. Like, I can measure the length of the pipe that I have there, get the same unions uh, and refit, recut, redo whatever. But the best part is, is like when I choose to do something like that, I can take it all apart and now everything's mobile, everything's modular, everything can come apart quick, easy, and back together. Uh, if, if I wanted to take my entire sump out to maintain my entire sump, a couple unions, pull that whole thing out. Oh, guess what? My sump broke, I'm gonna get the exact same one. Okay, put it all back, everything fits. Mm. Yeah. There you go. That's Unions. the reason. Unions. All right, I would say what's next, but it's going to be episode six. 